well 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 uh good evening to you and uh greetings in the name of our lord jesus christ welcome to our session today of ask the pastor bible study live my name is uh steve magua and i am delighted i am excited on uh, this second day after christmas to be joining with you on uh, what i believe will be a very very enlightening and interesting uh and just wonderful fellowship with my good friend and brother timothy uh, p martin uh all the way from montana he will be joining us shortly he's already in studio i want to welcome all of you very warmly wherever you are watching us from thank you whichever group you are on whatever uh belief you hold on the topic that we are going to be discussing i want to welcome you very warmly feel at home and as we are going to go ahead and have this discussion comments are welcome questions are welcome um as we go along i will uh, pick certain questions so please uh do two or three things for us uh as we begin number one if you can go ahead and go to my youtube channel uh and uh subscribe hit that notification bell if you're on youtube just type your comments in youtube uh the comments uh will be able to show up on my youtube channel and i will be able to present them here if you're on facebook also do the same and if i don't i'll be using my other device to make sure that i monitor the different questions that are coming up on this uh topic you can also go to beyond creation science uh dot com which is tim martin's uh website with beyond creation science and you can even go to their youtube channel from there now without much further ado i do want to go ahead and bring our brother tim onto the broadcast this is going to be more of a freewheeling uh discussion we will go through different uh things and we will learn a lot about um covenant creation so please help me to welcome my brother my good friend tim martin all the way from uh montana hi brother tim and welcome to our broadcast this evening hi steve always always a fun time talking with you and i just enjoy your teaching so much so thank you for the invite and uh, this is fantastic. I like the idea of an open format where we can cover questions and discussion and, and kind of range a whole bunch of different topics. So I, I'm looking forward to this. I think this is a great, great idea. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. awesome. Well, Brother Tim, uh, maybe we should begin with uh, just a little bit of a background. First of all, how was your Christmas? How are Amy and the kids? If you can give us just a little bit uh, about your life, your background, that would really sure. be helpful. Um, we had a great Christmas. My wife and I have nine children. So you can imagine we had a really full house. Right. <laughs> In fact, uh, my second oldest flew back to California today. So he's on his way back home for you know his uh, works work situation there in California. Um, but I have kids all over the country and they kind of come and go. We usually make the 4th of July a big deal here just because summertime in Montana is so hard to resist. And then the Christmas holiday is usually big too. Didn't quite get everybody back this year, but we had plenty. It's, it was a full house and extended family and my mom and, and everything. So it was a great Christmas. Thank you for asking. All right. Very good. Now, I'm not sure if uh, it's just happening on my side, but I'm going to ask those who are viewing us. And I don't know from your side, uh, Tim, uh, it seems as if your your video froze there for a moment. Um, and uh, th those who are watching us will be able to tell us how it is. Because sometimes, you know, it, it, on, in the studio, it seems as if it's freezing, but maybe it is not. Uh, and then we will be able to uh, adjust as we go along. So you say you have a big family just like mine you have nine children uh <laughs> some of my videos know that i have eight children so you know i had i had just a thought as i was preparing for this interview uh tim why don't we just combine you and i and we have a full church you don't need... <laughs> right i can never like we and my family and i can either move to montana we can move to st louis and we are we are, we are done and dusted man what do you think hey. That would be the easy way, man. It's like just instant church. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Now, uh, Tim, um, just for our viewers who are coming in, some of them uh, have no idea what covenant creation is or 
what it is that we are talking about. If you can give us a, a very basic and simple definition, what is covenant creation? Now, we will go back into the background and all that, but for right now, just so that those who are coming in can understand what is it that we are talking about, what is covenant creation? Right. So, obviously, it fits into the, into the paradigm of preterism in the sense that we believe in the fulfillment of the passing away of the old heavens and the old earth of Jesus's day, which is related to, of course, Israel and the law, but also related to uh, issues of creation uh, from the very beginning. So covenant creation views the beginning of the heavens and earth passing away at 8070 as the in the beginning heavens and earth of Genesis 1-1. So most simply, I think the, the easier way to explain it is we would say that the old covenant order is the Genesis 1 creation, which comes to a final end at the end of the age, at the consummation in AD 70. So uh, it's not just a matter of the law with Sinai. It's not just a matter of circumcision passing away. It's not just a matter of the Noahic covenant passing away, but actually it is the whole entire old covenant creation, which is inaugurated in our scriptures as the beginning first verse. And we see that as the beginning of the Old Testament. We would call it the, the Pentateuch or the law of Moses beginning in Genesis 1, 1. Okay. So if I would uh, summarize what I just had you say, and of course you and I have met in person and we'll talk about that if we get a, a chance. What you're saying is um, I'm, a, I'm a preterist. I'm a full preterist, which means I believe that all prophecy was fulfilled in the past. The second coming already took place in the past. The great tribulation already took place in the past. And um, what you're saying is that already full preterists and uh, preterists in general already believe that the first heaven and the first earth passed away at the second coming in 70 AD. And what covenant creation is saying is that the first heaven and the first earth that passed away is that which is described in Genesis 1. And so Genesis 1 is describing what you now call covenant creation. That's correct. I mean, we would all agree as preterists to believe in the fulfillment of, of passages like 2 Peter 3 and Revelation 21.1, you know, he, even Hebrews to a certain degree, that that is not referring to the physical universe like passing away, right? So it's not future to us. It's actually in our past. Right. Kind of creation just simply applies the exact same hermeneutic and understanding at the beginning of the story in Genesis 1-1, as we would view as, you know, kind of coming to an end at the end of the age in the New Testament prophecy. So it's all one story. It's all connected. And you can see this with the way the biblical authors are working from Genesis 1 in their eschatology. I mean, even Jesus in Matthew 23 sets up with uh, the Olivet Dis Discourse. In the context of the Olivet Discourse, he re refers to the blood of Abel that's okay. going to come upon this generation. So he's taking it back to the entire beginning of this entire old covenant age, which we would understood understand as, you know, this current age in biblical, um, in the New Testament, we'd have this age, and then we have the age to come. Right. And that would match the old covenant order beginning in Genesis 1, right. and the new covenant in Christ, which comes with his arrival as the Messiah of Israel, who brings into being that new covenant creation, which we would assume, uh, understand as the church the new heavens and new earth, the new Jerusalem in okay. fulfillment. Very well. Now, uh, thank you very much for that uh, just introductory um, definition of uh, covenant creation. Now, uh, as it happens, you are the co-author of a book called Beyond Creation Science. And now, uh, two questions that I have there. Did you and uh, your co-author, Jeff, whom, whom you may introduce to us, did you come up with the, the uh, did you coin the term uh, covenant creation or was that already there? Uh, where did that come from? And then uh, just uh, segue into that, into telling us how did you come into writing that book, uh, Covenant uh, Beyond Creation Science? So back, back in the early 2000s, um, the current book is actually a third edition. You know, okay. it came out from the printers in 2008. So the first edition was 2001. 
And I wrote that book when I was 26 years old in a congregational setting dealing with you know issues of, of uh, young earth creationism and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. But Jeff saw that first edition online. I think there was some discussion forum going on and some preterist forums. And, and Jeff got really excited. And um, he actually works in some high tech fields. Um, but Jeff Vaughn came along and he started making some amazing suggestions and such. And I just got to the point with the project that um, I got a second edition in 2005. And he continued to just fill my mind with just my just fantastic observations and suggestions for arguments. And at that point, I asked him, I said, Jeff, I really, really just need you to be co-author on this. And we need to write a whole new edition, bringing in all this, I, these, these just unbelievable insights that Jeff had. Okay. And, uh, you know, he's a, he's a PhD, so <laughs> you can't ever, you can't ever hurt having, you know, those credentials on the cover. So okay. Jeff came on and, uh, away we went with that third edition, which we currently have. And, uh, that's kind of the story. It was written over many years, mostly okay. winter times. Cause I work in the summertime, uh, but Montana winters are long. I get to, I get to focus on studies and, uh, kind of relax from the, from the farm work and our, our seasonal business. And uh, so that's that's really kind of the background of the story. Very good, very good. Now, uh, and what I was showing there while you were talking is, uh, and, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about it and then we will get into the content of the book. Uh, this is um, from, uh, let me see if I can pull it up again. Uh, no, here we are. Oh, here we go. So this is uh, on uh, beyondcreationscience.com. If you can just speak a little bit about, so that if anyone wants to go and check yeah. out what you're talking about, this is so, your website. Can you just uh, give us a little bit of a prime on it? Right, beyondcreationscience.com is the website. We've been, we've been, we opened that website in 2007, actually before the book came out from the okay. printer. Now we've basically sold out of our physical copies of the book. So if you want a copy of this book, we actually have it available for free download directly from beyondcreationscience.com. And we just put it out there just for anybody that wants to take a look at it because we sold out of physical copies. I think we printed like almost 4,000 copies and you know they just kind of started flying there right at the beginning and um, we went through them. So um, we decided that it's important that this material be available to new preterists and people studying the issue of Genesis creation. And so we just simply, you know, give it away for free as, you know, kind of the ministry side of our work. Um, but the website also has a lot of like continuing studies since 2007. Uh, as you can see, there's lots of different developments and updates and historical things. There's a section on related articles and recordings where you can go and you can read you know, basically anything that I've run across over the last 15 or 16 years that I thought, hey, that's super interesting. Or maybe it, you know, has some facet that is related to the book as far as, you know, the details in the book. So there's a lot of material there that's sort of archived. And we kind of use that, that website as an archive uh, over the last 15 or 16 years. And now I have the new YouTube channel, which I'm, I'm developing a lot of content uh, sort of an update there uh, for the YouTube platform. Okay, very good. Now let me let me come back out here. So those who want to find out more about uh, the book and what you have written and, and all that related material, you can go to beyondcreationscience.com. And uh, today today we have uh, Tim Martin, who is the co-author together with uh, Jeffrey uh, Vaughn. Uh, now both of you are full preterists. That's correct. correct. Okay, now right. can you define, uh, and I know some of the people who are viewing us are full preterists, so they already understand, but also we have friends and uh, associates who don't know what preterism is, don't know what full preterism is. What does it mean to say that you are a full preterist, uh, Tim? Right, so the big picture is that we view uh, the New Testament prophecies of the Olivet Discourse and the Book of Revelation as being fulfilled in the first century in that generation, specifically with the Jewish wars and the Roman destruction of Judea, uh, culminating in AD 70 with the destruction of the, the temple, which was kind of the center of, of Israel society. And of course, a full preterist view would look at that as the end of 
the old covenant age, the consummation that's spoken of in New Testament prophecy. And so we would look at that as from a from a fulfilled perspective, as opposed to looking at those prophecies as like, you know, future to us as sort of, you know, some future great tribulation across the entire world, uh, fulfillment of revelation, you know, at the end of the physical world, it's a very uh, different approach in the context, in the in the Hebrew context of the generation that Jesus would, and the apostles spoke to. Okay. So that is really a basic I- idea of what, what preterism is in general. And full preterism, you know, is descriptive. It's, it's at everything, including the millennium, um, the reign uh, of, of a new King David to establish his throne is now complete. And he reigns. Amen. So now, um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that when you wrote this book, and of course I know, but I just want to kind of put this information out there. Actually, most of the first part of your book, and I, you can tell us maybe how many chapters there are, deal with presenting the material on what is called covenant eschatology, full preterism. Uh, don't you do that in the book? Right. So, so when Jeff and I were talking about it, we we were you know we're working with a book that has a whole audience you know for the Genesis debate, and that's a very big debate. Actually, it's probably just as big as the eschatology in the evangelical world. So we wanted to have a final product with a book that we could give to any, you know, Christian in any church and they could like, you know, catch up with kind of our perspective first. So the first four chapters are part one and it's just an introduction, a basic introduction to fulfillment and uh, preterism. And then from there, you know, we say, okay, we'll just follow our, follow our, you know, line of thinking, follow our logic here, and let's apply this to things like Noah's flood and then the Tower of Babel. We even did a historical analysis um, related to how young earth creationism became so big on the American church scene. So there's some historical context there as well. And then we moved into sort of more, you know, involved Genesis creation issues sort of um, hints at where we kind of suggested things to go with the fulfillment of the old heavens and the earth. Okay. And that would be part two, which took, takes us all the way up to chapter, through chapter 18. And then chapters 19 through 21 is more of a, you know, a kind of a what now exploration. Right. So almost kind of looking at the implications of that for Christian worldview, for, for science, for understanding our Bible, you know, with, with a fulfillment um, mindset. So the, the book is laid out very carefully. So I do recommend anybody that, that looks at the book to actually read the book sequentially from beginning to end, because we actually designed the book to sort of build on layers and build on foundation that we put down in the, in the earlier parts of the book. And we'll actually come back to some ideas in new ways. Um, as you read the book. So, so it's, it's, it's very carefully laid out the structure. We spent as much time mm-hmm. on the structure of the book as we did on the content. And that makes it kind of unique for a book like this, um, because a lot of times it's just, you know, just a big pile of details that you see in the book. Very good. And I, and I can, I can testify Tim, that I have read the book, uh, I think I might be on my second reading now, maybe <laughs> almost that reading, because I and I, I, I have to say, when you first read it, even right. as a full preterist, uh, right. it's, it's very meaty, uh, it's very detailed, it's very complex. And uh, I, I know many people who have talked with me on the side, and they say, man, are you understanding what is going on here? <laughs> Can you explain? And, and I'm sure you've seen some of the times when I come into the broadcast and I'm, I actually put it on the screen and I explain it. So it is very well organized. And I really commend uh, both you and Jeffrey for the awesome, awesome work that uh, that you have done there. Now, I do have a question. And and by the way, I do see your question, Matt uh, Bingaman. Uh, we will come to the questions in a little while. Uh, so if you can hang in there, maybe five, five or so minutes, I will get to your questions. Uh, we do have some people that are like, now you got to answer this one, Tim. So <laughs> get, get ready. Uh, get you get your heart and your mind ready now. You, you talked about the fact that you're a full preterist. You believe that Jesus already came back. Uh, the judgment already took place in the past. I mean, how in the world do you even come to that as a Christian? Seriously, is this how you were brought up, Tim? Did you just come up in a family where you were told Jesus already came back? Or 
do you, where do you come from? Give us a little bit back, background of your right. history so, coming into this. Sure. Um, my background actually goes back generations with Bob Jones, independent Baptist dispensationalism. And okay. uh, my, gra my grandfather uh, in the 1900s was part of the leadership of Bob Jones. And he worked in the uh, Gospel Fellowship Association. He was a, the head of Gospel Fel Fellowship Association, which was the missionary arm of Bob Jones University. So, so my, my family goes back multiple generations in the Bob Jones fundamentalist sort of independent Baptist theology, which is dispensational. Okay. When I was in high school. I ran into some books by people like Gary DeMar. I started reading David Chilton. And actually, actually I was reading some of this sort of like um, Dominion theology stuff, some Reconstructionist stuff um, in high school at Bob Jones Academy. I got in, tr I got in trouble <laughs> reading it. But, um, you know, by the time I was a senior in high school, I kind of knew that I didn't belong in the in the dispensational world. And I kind of wanted out. And of course, once you realize that the Great Tribulation is past <laughs> and not future, um, you know, dispensationalism is over. It's, the, it's a failed paradigm at that point. So at that point, I began studying. Um, I just happened to li live in Greenville, South Carolina at the time where Bob Jones University is based. I was in the academy. I graduated from the academy. And in that particular neck of the woods, just a town over, is called Conesty, South Carolina. And there was a pastor who did a lot of work in preterism named Kenneth L. Gentry there. Oh, I've, so, I've heard of him. I've yes, heard of him. Okay. Lots of work. Um, he wrote Before Jerusalem Fell, which is an early dating of the Book of Revelation book, and then a lot of post-millennial theology as well. So as a teenager, I, I, um, my family and I kind of we were all kind of together at that point. So it, we kind of, we became members of Reedy River Presbyterian Church and Ken Gentry was our pastor for years and years and years. Okay. And um, lots of other stuff happened there too with some other, other authors that were kind of related to that whole theological paradigm. And that's, that's kind of my story. <laughs> big, so, big conversion from, from dispensationalism, Bob Jones, fundamentalism, you know, my parents were in the mission field. They uh -huh. were doing Christian school education with Christian day schools for their entire career up to that point. And then, you know, you, <laughs> the wow. great tribulation is passed. <laughs> that was wow. total paradigm shift. Exactly. Now, 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 was it a gradual shift for you from futurism to straight uh, full progressive or was it a uh, progressive? Yes, yes. I would say that that shift probably took place over seven or eight years. Okay. Because, you know, we kind of went from, from the Bob Jones dispensationalism, fundamentalism, premillennialism, to more of a Presbyterian covenant theology view, kind of the older classical, you know, Calvinist doctrine and stuff. So um, they had the partial preterism that kind of worked with that sort of explains why you're not looking forward to the great tribulation and things like that. But, um, I was in Presbyterianism for many years. And, um, then I just, you know, as you keep studying that the dominoes keep falling over and, and by, by late, the late 1990s, you know, just recently married and our first children here and we moved to Montana. I was working in a, in a small country church here and doing my studies. I just, I just couldn't make the partial preterism thing work because the hermeneutic just became self-contradictory and, and incoherent, essentially. Very well. So now, um, so you, 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 you start to move away from uh, dispensationalism, from uh, futurism, and you begin to enter. Your pastor, Ken Gentry, is a well-known partial preterist. Uh, I hear, and I know that you told me this, and I've heard you talk about it, uh, you met your wife, Amy, at one of the conferences by Gary Dima. Yes. Um, my wife and I first met in 1993, the summer of 1993. We were both teenagers, uh -huh. and uh, she was from here in Montana. And uh, we met at the the American Vision Life Preparation Conference, which was like a, like a one-week-long uh, youth camp, okay. uh, sort of training young Christian kids for Christian worldview and preparation for life. 
and uh, we met there. So I have a lot to thank Gary DeMar for because, you know, we have nine children and and uh, we've just been blessed so much for so many years that um, it was his ministry that was used of God to, to bring us together, you know, with American Vision and uh, all the work that they do. So it's just been in a bit, it's been amazing. So, yeah, that's awesome. that's a, that's a fun story. Awesome, awesome. 30, year, 30 years ago, last summer. Wow, very good. And, and by the way, congratulations on the, the 30 years that you've been together with your wife. Uh, coming up with the anniversary, yeah, because we met and then we have the, the wedding later. So we're coming up on the 30 for the anniversary as well. Yep. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Now, um, let's get into these questions because uh, there are people who are watching here and they want to get some questions out of you. Uh, we are not going to be very uh, rigid in our, in our structure here. Now, but Matt Bing, Bingaman, I mentioned him earlier, uh, and he asked this question. If you don't think Genesis 1 and 2 describes the creation of the physical earth, do you consider yourself an evolutionist? And you can answer uh, whichever way you feel is the best way to give sure. your perspective. Well, that's a, that's a really hard question because it would depend on the definition of evolution and okay. the whole discussion. And, you know, Everybody actually is an evolutionist. Even young earth creations talk about microevolution and change of species over time. I mean, the broadest idea is the evolution is the change over time. And um, everybody agrees with that. So everyone is an evolutionist. The question is, you know, how far does that go on a physical level? And uh, I am not trained in the sciences. Uh, it's not really an issue for me. I work on my farm with, with natural organisms, organisms and, you know, soil science and biology. So I understand some basic ideas of evolution theory and, you know, a lot of it works for us very well with our regenerative agriculture. So um, I'm kind of an agnostic on the whole big evolution thing because, you know, it's, it's a very, very big question. And I think it's it's not one of those things that you can approach very simplistically. And a lot of people take it way too simplistically. They just simply don't know, you know, the actual arguments or pro or con. There's also the intelligent design movement, which accepts certain ideas of of long ages, millions of years and stuff. But but the idea is that it, that evolution is a guided process, and and clearly we can see um, mm -hmm. irreducible complexity that shows you know God's involvement at that. At some level. So that's a really, really, really involved question. It's not even a question that, that we dive into in the book because we're working on what the Bible teaches about Genesis creation. Um, and, and our conclusion essentially is, um, you know, to the degree of what those issues are, what's true is, you know, that's what science is for to figure out. And if it's true, it's God's truth um, one way or the other. That's, that's, that's how I approach it. So it's, it's a hard question to ask, though, because answer, because everybody has a different definition of evolution. So are you an evolutionist? Well, everybody's an evolutionist, including the young earth creationists. They believe that all the animals that came off the ark right. evolved into, you know, the deserts and the rainforests and, and the ocean. Everything evolved, you right. know, from a within, within a very short time, in a very short time. So everybody's an evolutionist here. Um, we just sort of disagree about a lot of, a lot of framework and paradigms and stuff as far as, and I, I'm not, I'm not settled on the issue. I'm not scientifically trained. Um, you know, that's kind of where I'm at. Okay. Well, well maybe, uh, and, and, and I, and I, and I, I, I think I will agree that, uh, that's a very broad question. Let's mm -hmm. focus here on what you teach in beyond creation science concerning Genesis one and two. Uh, and let me ask a very pointed question. Is the creation described in Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two in the view of uh, your book, is it the creation of the physical material world as we know it? And if so, why, if not, uh, what are some of the ways that you guys have come to think about it and what scriptures support your view? Sure. So, so I guess the best way to, to use an analogy for covenant creation is a marriage, right? Okay. So if you have a covenant marriage between a man and a woman, that creates a world, 
a, a, a new family, really. It's something brand new. Uh-huh. But it's, it's, not, it's not that the man and the woman have a different biology after they get married or right. after they establish the covenant household. Uh-huh. So the analogy there is that we have a covenant relationship between God and his people beginning with Adam. I mean, it's, it's the beginning of a covenant world. There's no, there's no material description there uh, on the same reasons that we would say the passing away of the old heavens and the old earth in 8070 didn't change the function of, you know, the whole physical world, however you understand that. So it's the very same covenant priority that we see all through the scriptures, because actually you can see this with the prophets too, because they talked about, you know, Isaiah 65, 17 talks about, I saw a new heaven and new earth. And, you know, he's, he's working off that same Genesis language from Genesis one, and he's seeing the new covenant creation. So it's covenant creation all the way through scripture to the new covenant creation in Jesus Christ. So I don't see any physical aspect of like the beginning of the material creation. Now it may be that you have like a, like a temple context with the garden of Eden where you have, you know, sacrifices being offered where you have like a, a job being given to Adam to, to, to be a ministry as a King priest in his world. Now, obviously that involves like physical things, right? Cause you've got you know people there that you're, that you're engaging with. And I think that's where you see the parallels between Adam as a priest king, and later you see the the priests of the Levites, the, a lot of the same language from Genesis two Hebrew, like Adam was made to work the garden. Well, that's the exact same language that's used about the Levites in the temple. They are to work in their service, um, representing the people in Israel to God. So um, there's a lot of connections there that you know, just shows that this story is not about the beginning of the material world at all. And when you get to become a preterist, it's like, oh, that's why. Because right. the issue of covenant relationship, that's more important than anything else. And preterism highlights that. And that's why our view has grown within preterist circles, because it's a consistent, coherent, integrated like worldview of um, a hermeneutic approach and understanding. Uh, now, uh, yet, yet at the same time, uh, Brother Tim, wouldn't you admit that there are many uh, very strong preterist teachers who are still, uh, you know, stalling on giving up on the fact that we have all been brought up traditionally believing that Genesis yeah. 1 is describing the beginning of the universe, the, the creation of the very first human being and uh, you know six or t- six to ten thousand years ago uh why is there th- that um discord between covenant eschatology the end and covenant creation the beginning right well i think i think on the on the big picture thing i mean there's a lot of details because you've got a lot of different people coming from different backgrounds and different mm-hmm. ideas and mm-hmm. you know they have different experiences you know fighting various different issues but i I think the big picture is a lot of preterists come from dispensational premillennial circles. They just sort of, that's where a lot of new preterists are coming from. And we wrote chapter six to explain the history of why dispensationalism overtook the entire young earth creationist. Um, you know, it took young earth creationism as, as just, just overwhelming the, the American conservative church. So there's a lot of baggage there. I believe that's a big picture. And they, people just, you know, they don't want to change culture. They, they, they like the idea of saying, okay, well, the, the, the all of it discourse is fulfilled, but they come from a culture of thinking certain ways about the world. And those are actually, you know, held more tightly than, you know, is the all of it discourse past or future, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so it's a cultural issue that's a much deeper thing there. And fundamentalism is is very, very deep in the psyche of a lot of conservative Christians. So they feel uncomfortable with reexamining Genesis. Um, that's my been my experience. They don't want to. And, you know, so they either do, they do one of two things. Right. 
they'll either completely ignore Genesis and say, they're not going to talk about it. They're not going to study it. We don't have to figure it out. We're going to focus on eschatology right. or they get really, really upset, you know, and just, you know, everything goes to argument from this detail and that detail or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it, it's amazing because it's a lot like when you, you take preterism to, you know, a new environment and you start introducing Protestant people in American Christian churches, they'll do two things, one of two things, right? Right. They'll either just ignore you. <laughs> we don't want to hear that anymore. Just act like it doesn't exist. Just, right. it, just completely ignore you. Or right. they'll blow up. So it's the same, kind of the same psychology there of, um, of the challenge to old beliefs. And we feel comfortable with beliefs. I mean, that that's not hard to understand as far as the way human logic goes and, and the interaction between belief and worldview, it feels uncomfortable um, given the way fundamentalism has presented the issue for a couple generations, at least back to, you know, the Scopes trial and then, you know, the rise of young earth creationism in the 60s with um, Wickham and Morris and the Genesis flood. Okay. Now, um, let me ask you a very uh, controversial question here, Tim. And I, I hope you don't mind me putting you on the spot. Absolutely, dude. <laughs> was Adam in the Bible the first human being to exist in the view of beyond creation science? In the view of beyond creation science, we are completely silent about that issue. We never raised that issue in the book. We didn't discuss it. Um, we had those questions in the back of my, our mind when we wrote the book. But as far as the book goes, okay. it is not an issue that we cover in the book. All right. Now, what about uh, in the years uh, after that? I know because I know that question comes up a lot of times in the uh, especially in the preterist forums when covenant creation comes up. Are you guys saying that uh, human beings as a species already existed, that uh, this Adam man is the covenant man of God? Where, where does that all play in? So, yeah, that's a big question. And uh, I'm working on. You know, with a conference that we had at your place, yes. I had two presentations that sort of were connected and they were more introductory. And then I had another conference with Michael Miano at Blue Point Bible Church in October, mm -hmm. just a couple of months after your conference. And I gave two more presentations. And, and I was thinking about these four presentations uh, from the early, from like as soon as you invited me in the spring, I don't remember what month it was, probably March or April, we were working right. in the greenhouse. Right. But I was thinking of, of what to do with this conference and, um, and the following conference that I was expecting as well. And so I put together a four part series, which does get into that issue of Adam as the first human being or the first covenant man. And I interact with Augustine's view because Augustine going back 1500 years, Augustine assumed that the only people in the book of Genesis that are being referenced there is Adam and Eve. Okay. And he started there with his theology and, and developed a whole like Christian theology from the four, 400s that we are still living with today. And of course, that makes the traditional issues very, very deep with a lot of people. So in this four part presentation, I'm really trying to sort of like discuss some traditional ideas and evaluate preterism for implications and looking at language and details. And so we have gone much further than the way beyond creation science just sort of left it hanging, left it open. Um, I do believe that uh, Augusta made a mistake in Genesis, and I believe that Genesis shows that there were other people uh, regarding, you know, Cain going off and building a city, um, mm -hmm. one of the sons of, of Adam and Eve, um, and he got married too, and, you know, all kinds of stuff that looks, wait a second, there must be people around here somewhere. But Augustine didn't really go with those details, but um, we have lots more reasons, given a preterist hermeneutic, to question that idea. And, and of course, the problem that Augustine had was he started with a material creation, that's mm -hmm. the beginning of, and he was very, you know, sort of symbolic about it. Um, the idea that everything, God had created everything at once. There was no time involved. There's no seven days, six days or anything like that. But, but he really was talking about a physical material creation. And that meant in his theology, he looked forward to the judgment 
to the consummation, to the end of the world. So for, for Augustine, his creation and his eschatology were both material creation. That, of course, made him futurist. Right. So even when we're talking about this tradition and this theology, we're dealing with, we're bumping up against eschatology at the very same time. And that's what makes it really fascinating. And so my four part series, which I'm working on, you know, kind of releasing bit by bit in smaller videos on YouTube, we'll be going into that discussion about Augustine's assumptions and presuppositions about Genesis. And we'll be presenting a different paradigm, a different framework that actually is developed self-consciously okay. from a perspective. Very good. Now, you have been accused, and uh, I have been party to seeing that uh, uh, happening, that you guys are coming up with some um, just crazy, um, you know, theology, uh, which is uh, totally novel, and nobody else has thought about those kind of things. Are there other reliable, well-known scholars who may or may not be preterists, who may be futurists or not, that have arrived at the same conclusions that you guys have arrived in, uh, with, uh, with the beyond creation science and with covenant uh, creation just in general. Would you talk about that and would you give us some, some uh, just mentions here and there? Right, two things about that. First of all, a lot of people that make that claim have never read beyond creation science. Okay. And they, and they make claims that are just false. And, and we've, been, we've been dealing with that for 15 years. And you would think if somebody starts making a claim that they would quote you accurately, but you know, that's a bit much to ask these days because people like to just you know, swing wildly. So a lot of times you know, it's hard to even respond because they're not even accurate in what they're saying about beyond creation science because they've never read it. <laughs> right. So let's start there. If you're going to make a claim, please cite us and explain where we said that. And then and then let's talk. We're OK for talking, but it's kind of hard to talk about things you never said. <laughs> it happens a lot. I mean, it happened. I don't I, I haven't even been able to count how many times that's happened since the early 2000s. So let's start there. OK, so the second question is on my web page beyond creation science and, and, and team and team if you can just hold on just for a second you're you're, you're um you, you may be having some network issues and I, I want just to apologize to those who are watching us but we'll kind of just go through it because sometimes the network issues will affect how the video is coming through so people just hang in there and let's just continue but con you continue. Know, you, you look fine on your side steve from my side but we do have a lot of cloud cover and kind of a, kind of a gloomy um winter day here so it right. could be it could be the actual weather here in montana creating that problem right but let's go to the second issue the second issue is on my on the home page of beyondcreationscience.com like the third or fourth selection on the home page i have a page titled white um favorite um wider scholarship or something like you know favorite citations from wider scholarship uh -huh. <laughs> And we just cite, I think there's probably two dozen citations there of, of everybody from like dispensationalist to like N.T. Wright to preterists who are saying the exact same things that we're saying. You know, they may not make all the connections or they might not go that far with certain details, but we have a page right there on our, on our homepage mm -hmm. called a Wider Scholarship. And I just challenge people, look at that and ask yourself, you know, isn't this re really where Genesis studies is going? I mean, John Walton is a good example. N.T. Wright is a good example. G.K. Beale. Um, it's all, it's all, that's all what we're working with. And we cite them. I also have a new video on the YouTube channel um, titled, uh, Is Covenant Creation Just Plain Crazy? <laughs> I'm just making it up. Where I, I spend, I don't know, it was like 20 something minutes or 30 minutes going through a lot of these citations and saying, you know, we're relying on great scholars here. You know, nobody's claiming that these people are making anything up. Well, we're just sort of building on their foundation. So I challenge if anybody wants to look at, at those related citations from wider scholarship, there's dozens of them. And they're co they cover all kinds of issues that, that we are, you know, talking about in Beyond Creation. And, so, and this is great, Steve, because some of these issues, 
we were talking about in 2001 and some of these books came out later, right? right. right. So, so it wasn't just that we were working within a context of Hebrew scholarship and Christian theology. We were anticipating things and, and we were laying out ideas that end up being confirmed by people like John Walton, mm -hmm. N.T. Wright, G.K. Beale. And it's like, you know, that's amazing that preterist understanding of preterist understanding of eschatology could give you like all these new tools and, and new hermeneutic ways of thinking about the narrative of scripture, you know, as a, in a Hebraic context. Right. And you can actually lay out things that make a lot of sense. And then you find out years later that, you know, even futures are now saying this. And we were relying on some older stuff like John Salehammer. John Salehammer was a Hebrew scholar, uh, uh, a dispensational Hebrew scholar. And he was making all these connections between Adam and Israel and priestly things. And so, yeah, I mean, it's been going on. You go, you go back further in the 20th century. Um, there's a lot of great material. Now, of course, young earth creations don't like any of that, right? Because they want a scientific reading. And if it right. doesn't read science, then, oh, it's not true. But I would argue, and we've argued in Beyond Creation Science, that if you're looking for science, you're actually the modernist. Right. You're putting your ideas on the text and you're demanding from the text something that may not be there at all because you're a modernist. You're a liberal. You're just a right wing liberal. Right. right so right. we talk about that in the book. And, you, you know, the biblical interpretation of Genesis is what the biblical authors mean in their original audience and context. And those things take work to figure out. Those, you know, understanding scripture, interpreting scripture is key to this. The hermeneutic of, of uh, Milton S. Terry and all the other preterists that have done so much amazing work. That's all we were doing. And all of a sudden it's like, you know, people, you know, go crazy because they don't want to change their ideas of what Genesis is about. And and that's that's difficult because. Here we are as preterists asking the futurist world to examine prophecy, right? Right. We're asking them to change their ideas because, you know, the old ob obsolete futurism cannot be biblically demonstrated. But if you turn around and say, well, let's look at Genesis again, all of a sudden, you know, we become hypocrites because we're like, no, we're not going to ever change Genesis because, you know, we'll just be liberals. If well, we do well, that. but, well, that's the fundamentalism. If you if you change Genesis, then you lose Christianity. Isn't this the, well, the charge that has been leveled against you? That's the that's the problem is that if you take away if you take away that young earth of creationist approach to Genesis, you know, they they believe, you know, the entire Christian worldview collapses. If you read answers in Genesis stuff, that's the way they frame it. Of course, they also frame it in terms of futurism, looking forward to the fulfillment of prophecy, which, you know, my guy, my my situation is I just look at it. And after many years of interacting with critics and questions and stuff, and that I just see hypocrisy. You guys really don't believe in these principles of preterism when it gets outside of the narrow field of prophecy. And, you know, the Bible just doesn't work that way, friends. Genesis 1 is used all through the scriptures by all the different prophets. It's used Genesis 1, 2, and 3. It comes up in Bible prophecy, 2 Peter 3. It comes up in the book of Revelation. It comes up in Jesus' all of the discourse with Matthew 23 and his teaching on Sabbath. You know, Sabbath is rooted in Genesis chapter 1. That's where the Sabbath was ordained, according to Moses in the law. So, you guys, I get the I get the uncomfortability, and I don't want to push people. I don't want to become an ass, you know, about the whole thing, you know, mm -hmm. being a right. jerk. Right. But here's my here's my conclusion after year, two decades of working on this issue is if preterism is true, the principles of preterism work all through the Bible, beginning in Genesis 1, 1. In, in fact, uh, what I wanted you to do, and I know that this is not so much a teaching interview, so it's not sure. we didn't come here to exegete scripture per se, but uh, at the very least, because you are a Bible teacher and I'm also a Bible teacher, uh, yeah. at least I'm following in your footsteps, I'm a few years behind, but could you, uh, uh, even if it's just, and I can pull up the Bible here in a moment, uh, give us an example of how the New Testament authors in the Bible use Genesis 1 and how we preterists uh, understand it and then how it ties back to 
Genesis, and you can you can ask me to go anywhere, and and, I, and I'll set it up, and uh, we'll do that because I think it's important, especially for those who are here. They are preterists. They are they are serious about exegesis. They are serious about hermeneutics, uh, and they are saying, show us an example of how this works. Of course, we we want to recommend that people read the book, and it's it's a, a, a whole copy of I, I don't know how many pages, a couple hundred pages. Yeah, yeah, five five hundred and something. 500 and something, but uh, if you can give us a, a, a live example that, that then I know I'm putting you on the spot uh, right yeah. here. You know, one of my favorite ones is Hebrews chapter one, because I think that's so blatantly obvious. Hebrews one, beginning in verse 10 and 11, you'll see if you pull it up uh, on the- Hold on, Tim, I'm, I'm, I'm actually gonna pull it up here in, in a moment, uh, just continue just setting it up and I'll, and I'll, and I'll put it up on, on, the, uh, on the screen in a moment. But just so continue book, speaking. Yeah, the book of Hebrews is really focused in on covenant transition uh, from old covenant to new covenant. It's like that, that, that one book that really, really preterists love because it talks about the coming of the, of the high priest out of the Holy of Holies um, for victory and the arrival of um, the promise of eternal life and stuff. So, so if you look at Hebrews chapter one, uh -huh. there we are. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so moving on to verse 10, Must you'll see you. that, that it says, um, you Lord laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning uh -huh. and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. So, so here we have the, the, the author of Hebrews, and he's actually citing a passage from Psalm 102, which is related to God's people. But this idea of wearing out of the heavens and the earth is, um, you know, is, is associated directly with in the beginning language. In fact, you know, it's, it's pretty blatant directly um, through Psalm 102 that the writer of Hebrews is referring to Genesis 1.1. And that's what's going to perish. That's what's going to wear out like a garment. And if you look at it... Would, would, would you like for me to go to Psalm 102 and, and uh, just to have this reference? Well, I, I don't know. That's Psalm really necessary. I mean, it's, it's, it's a citation. Okay. It's a direct citation. So, um, yeah, so... If you look at the context, all right. Of so, so, it's, 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 it's explain, explain to us here. So, the writer of Hebrews is saying that whatever was created in the beginning, whatever was laid out, the earth and the heavens, were going to wear out. They were going to be rolled up. They were going to, uh, uh, to to perish, right? And that's, now, how that's, have how have preterists uh, traditionally looked at that passage in Hebrews chapter one, verse ten and verse eleven? They uh, generally associate it with the old covenant order, and okay. so they'll say it was a beginning, but it may be it may be referring to Sinai, or maybe to Abraham. It's not referring to Genesis one one. Now, when other when other places come up in the Bible, like John one one, it says in the beginning was the Word. <laughs> nobody nobody disagrees. nobody goes anywhere else except Genesis one. <laughs> no, no. But Hebrews 1, 10 refers to that which was made in the beginning, and it says it's going to pass away. And the Greek there in Hebrews 1, 10 uh, and 11 comes up again in Hebrews, I believe it's um, uh, 9. Hebrews 20, 8. 8. 8. Yeah, Hebrews 8. It's the same, referring to this, it uses this very same Greek word of passing away or, or wearing out right. in direct reference to the Old Covenant. So, to the to the writer of Hebrews' mind, the old creation. Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, let me let me, let me pull that up, uh, brother Tim, because I I yes. do want us to at least uh, I, I want us to be able to demonstrate this uh, for those who are wanting uh, to see this demonstrated. Uh, so this 8, is the passage in, in Hebrews eight thirteen. If you could just in, uh, speak about it. In, yeah, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Right. And you can even see in English that that's using the very same language. But the Greek is the same word as we saw in Hebrews 1, which is the 
in the beginning, heavens and earth. So, so you have this connection through Psalm 102 of the in the beginning, heavens and earth. And then you have this connection in Hebrews 8, 13. This is the old covenant, right. you know, which we as predators would say, you know, that's referring to what's coming in 80, 70. It's about to pass away. You know, they're almost there. Um, you know, in fact, they kind of they've come to New Jerusalem, you know, at that at that very late, late, late part of the first century before AD 70. So that would be, you know, Hebrews right. 1 connected with Hebrews 8, 13 is, is one of those fairly obvious ones that, you know, if if the writer of Hebrews is referring to Genesis 1, 1, then that means that the Genesis 1 creation is the old covenant and it right. passed away. Right, and and that is what uh, if you could if you could just speak on this a little bit, this is what happens here in Revelation twenty one. Is that is that correct? So I would argue that Revelation twenty one one is mm. also a parallel text to Hebrews one ten eleven and you know eight thirteen. So we see John writing, "Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away." And the sea was no more. Right. Yeah. And that really says the same thing. What what the first heaven and earth is, the first one, of Genesis 1-1, one, one, where we see the Sabbath being instituted by God through the creation account, where we see in 1-14, we see the reference to the signs and the signs and seasons referring to the feast of Israel as we as scripture unfolds. And even in Revelation 21, 1, there is no more sea, right? right That's an right. element of Genesis chapter 1, because Genesis chapter 1 follows that pattern of heaven, earth, and sea, which is a temple architecture. Okay. You see that, met, that sort of, that's the idea behind the tabernacle and the temple. So, so obviously the book of Revelation is referring to the Genesis 1 creation as well, just like the book of Hebrews does in a little different way. It's like an artistic variation, but the same theme and same idea. Right. And if you open any, open any commentary on either Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, 11, or a commentary on Revelation 21, 1, everybody knows that it's going to Genesis chapter 1. There's no debate. The only people that have some harebrained idea that this isn't talking about Genesis one are predators. But, the ones but, but, but let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Tim. Before covenant creation became a thing, were preterists already arguing that that uh, Hebrews one ten is not about Genesis, or that uh, you know Revelation twenty one is not about Genesis one? They they weren't addressing the issue when I was in it. They just okay. didn't ask the question. In fact, I did a video about Max King and I asked the question with Max King, you know, writing since 19, 1953, he began preaching. Max right. King started preaching like 1952 or 1953. And I asked the question, what does Max King teach about Genesis 1? And he preached for decades and he mm -hmm. wrote huge tombs of books, uh, Cross and the Parousia, still just amazing book on fulfillment and covenant eschatology. There was one passage that mentions Genesis 1 and just assumes that it's the material physical world. Right. No discussion, no exegesis, no like examination of how that fits to Hebrews 1 or Revelation 21. Another big one is 2 Peter 3, because 2 Peter 3 talks about Genesis 1 too, in terms of you know, he, God made the earth rise up from the waters. Right. Right. Day right, three, right. Yes. That's passing away. So yes. everywhere, and and I for the I've looked. I can't find. I've asked people. I ran a competition. If you go to the YouTube website, oh, I, I don't remember the competition. You you are giving away a free book. <laughs> if somebody can tell me what Max King was wrote about the details of Genesis one and why he believed that that was a material universe, I'll send you a free copy, signed copy with double double sign with both authors. Right, and it doesn't exist. We, we as preterists were focused on eschatology, right? It's like a blind spot because we're looking at eschatology. We don't ask questions about Genesis other than, you know, things like Adamic death, right? How, how, does, how does the redemption of Messiah overcome 
the Adamic death, which, mm -hmm. by the way, takes us back to Genesis, early chapters of Genesis. You know, we asked sort of like, uh, you know, the idea of, um, uh, you know, of how the garden is presented in Revelation 21 and 22 as part of the holy city. Right. So, you know, the Garden of Eden with the tree of life is a symbolic picture of Christ himself. He is the tree of life. Even right. the Proverbs talk about, the Psalms talk about, you know, the godly man being a tree who gives life. So these are biblical themes that work all through the scriptures. And we were focused, you know, back in the early days in the 90s when I was a preterist, we were focused on es eschatology. I think it was just a matter of the fight. You know, when you're dealing with dispensationalism and futurism, it it eats up your focus, it eats up your time, and we kind of were blind to issues of Genesis, except for the ones that really make a difference. And right. there's some work on that, but you know, it was just not it was just not in view. Very good, very good. Now there's a question here, and this one comes from Don Stan. I'm gonna put it on the screen because somehow how these uh, different servers work. Some of the comments are coming on the computer. Some of them are coming on my phone. So for those whose comments are can only be seen on another device, please don't think that I've ignored your and uh, I've ignored your 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 comments. But don't stay. She's in Australia. Uh, she's part of the preterist uh, movement, uh, and she says I'm a covenant creation believer, but I don't believe in the flat earth. Are they associated? And if so, why is it not gelling with me? Right. First of all, flat Earth has nothing to do with covenant creation, uh -huh. uh, and and we never we never even raised the issue of flat Earth and beyond creation science because we had never met anybody in the two thousands that was into flat Earth stuff. You know, we, I think there's a passing reference to geocentrism, right. but flat Earth is sort of a new development um, online, mainly um, kind of the way the online searches and stuff work and puts what people are looking for in front of them. But um, there's no there's no connection to flat Earth stuff. Um, I I personally believe it's just kind of like a cult at this point because it's just a religion, um, and and they rely on a particular reading and hermeneutic of Genesis creation that is material, like literal, right? And mm -hmm. and that that you know if you look at if you look at David Curtis as uh, okay, the, I, I was going to ask you, and I, I was kind of debating in my head whether to ask you about it. Whether to, to mention him, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I mean, we have on my YouTube uh, site, I've got a, a playlist titled Non Covenant Creation Teachings. And right there is David Curtis doing a two part series on flat earth. And, and you just look at it, he's reading it just like a dispensationalist. He reopens Genesis 1, he assumes that it, the heaven and earth is about the physical world. Okay. And never asks the question of, you know what how does this fit with the rest of scripture and what about the other parts of scripture that that we've been talking about how do they interact with genesis one he just assumes right. and that's what dispensationalists do that's their hermeneutic it's the literal hermeneutic and he'll talk about you know thorns and thistles as being part of you know god's curse on the earth um as a result of adam's sin and stuff and he still believes that and right. honestly um Beyond saying that it's just ridiculous, there's not really much I can say because you're just, it's a self-contradictory hermeneutic. It's just incoherent because Jesus never re re resolves the curse if it's talking about the physical stuff of life. I mean, we have a failed redemption. That's what David Curtis teaches. Jesus never takes away the curse. Right. We live forever, forever with thorns and thistles because of Adam's sin. It's, right. it's absurd. Oh, and, 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 and what about the idea of if Genesis 1, for preterists now, uh, if Genesis 1 is the material creation, uh, then the first earth and the first heaven never passed away. Right. And see, when, when Beyond Creation Science came out in 2008, mm -hmm. we had a very large formal debate about this issue. It's actually listed on the, on the homepage of beyondcreationscience.com, a formal debate in 2008. And my opponent in that debate, and Jeff was involved too, and a few others, but my opponent in that debate was a conference speaker at preterist conferences. He had books that he had written for full preterism in the preterist movement. And after our debate, within a matter of a few months, he walked out of full preterism. And people say, oh, he just lost his mind. He just went bonkers or whatever. 
No, you haven't read the debate because actually what this individual did was he realized what we were saying in the connection between Genesis and, and prophecy right. is true. So that left him with a choice. Are you going to choose your young earth creationism right. and go with that and give up your preterist beliefs? Or are you going to go with your preterist beliefs and give up your young earth creationism? And for this particular individual, his idea of young earth creationism was was more preeminent, more basic to his beliefs than his prophecy was. And he made the logical choice when shown that you can't have one or the other logically. Right. He's very logical. And he chose young earth creationism. And he became a big critic of full preterism because of these physical concerns, physical universe, physical curse, physical redemption, physical body of resurrection in the future and stuff. So, you know, these people uh, read the old debates. They, they right. weren't, they weren't being absurd. They actually were perfectly logical once they understood that the case what, we were what, making is what it, took, what, what it really meant. Exactly. And there have been others too. That's not the only one. So, right. so all, all we're bringing to the table is to open up the idea of the scriptures as far as a preterist hermeneutic from Genesis 1 right. to Revelation 22. And we're just asking people, if, if, if this isn't consistent, then show us why it's not consistent. And that's where, you know, on cross-examination and back and forth, you realize we just have a vendetta against particular beliefs that we really don't want to go there a lot of times. Um, and at that point, you know, people have to make their own mind up and, and choose what they what they believe is more important. True. So now, actually, now that brings us to a question, uh, a comment that I want you to, to speak on here is by Dr. Janet Gishao, who is actually hailing from California. And this is what Dr. Janet says. And she is, I think, from the tone you'll tell, she's rather frustrated. She said, okay. it would be easier if people were told upfront that the Bible wasn't written to them directly and understanding how they got grafted into it. Uh, I would like for you, and I know this is more of a general issue, it's not just covenant creation, but it has to do with the hermeneutic. Why is it that there is such a, a disconnect, a discord between what the average Christian understands about what the Bible is speaking about versus what the Bible is actually speaking about? Yeah, that's that's a hard question because you know there's a lot of different answers to that that probably are different factors and contributing factors. Mm -hmm. um, uh, clearly, we have we live in a in an age where Christians are not very biblically literate. They don't really spend a lot of time reading the scriptures for themselves. Mm -hmm. So they so they they go to church and they listen to preachers, right? And the preacher just says, "This is what we believe," for whatever reason. Maybe he opens the Bible and reads it. Mm -hmm. But, but we have we have an issue, and, and this has been a problem throughout church history, in the sense that you know even like in the medieval ages, a lot of the common people didn't know what the scriptures said, so they were just relying on you know the, what the priest said or what their Bible teacher said, and we're we're kind of at that situation right now, mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't read and digest and sort of like really, really meditate on the details of the, for, for example, the Old Testament. You know, in dispensationalism, the Old Testament doesn't matter, right? You live in a new dispensation. Right, right. <laughs> we live in the, the church age or whatever. Yes. The mm -hmm. well, if you have an idea that I live in the church age and the Old Testament is a different dispensation, why would you read it? Right, right. So, so part of this is dispensationalism, right? Part of it's just people being lazy. Part of it's just people just believing whatever their preachers say. Mm -hmm. You know, and these preachers, they're coming from dispensational colleges. Right. So, so they're bringing the same idea from the leadership position. Um, that's that's a huge, huge problem um, that, that we as predators face because, I mean, I've had a situation where I sit down and talk with, with people in church leadership about prophecy they don't even know what I'm talking about. Right. As far as text. How do you have a conversation when leadership in right. churches don't know the Bible? 
Yeah, that, that is a very uh, sad situation. Now, you came, uh, and I and I know that I've listened to some of your interviews back in the, uh, you know, 2008, let's say with Gary DeMai and so on and so forth. One of the issues that uh, brought you to where you are with uh, Beyond Creation Science and Covenant Creation was the discussion about the global flood or the local uh, flood. Would you give us a little bit of a background where you started with that and how you came up to believe what you believe, and if you can give a summary of what you believe concerning what does the Bible teach about the flood? Okay, so so this was actually the first issue on the first edition. It was actually dedicated to the issue of the flood, looking okay. at language about the great tribulation that Jesus uses and the Bible uses, and you know, is this really something that um, that the Bible teaches that so many people assume the Bible teaches? And it had to do with a church situation where Young Earth Creationist Organization was going to do a seminar here in Montana with our local church. And a few other elders wanted to bring that group, uh, Answers in Genesis, to our church. And, and I vetoed that idea because, you know, I, I kind of explained that that would not really be helpful for the covenant focus that we were trying to, to teach our homeschoolers about because we have a whole gaggle of church of homeschoolers. So that didn't go over very well. And they actually had the event at another location. And most of the families went. I didn't go. Um, but, you know, when when they went there and they they sat and watched what happened, it it sort of went down exactly lo- like the way I explained it would. And there was all kinds of futurism and, you know, the end of the world's near. The Great Tribulation is coming. So get saved. It was just all mixed up with the, 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 the escapism of pre-millennial dispensationalism and they came back and they're like you know that was yeah that didn't work out so good i mean they still believed young earth creations doctrine so so i had in a church setting i had to write an article and it was only like 30 or 40 pages explaining why the scriptures don't teach a global flood and and i looked at the language and the hermeneutic and then the theology of it too because jesus is comparing the great tribulation to Noah's flood in Matthew 24 and the, all of the discourse. So that's where it all kind of started because if you understand young earth creationism, the, it's, I'll say it this way. The global flood is young earth creationism, young earth creationism's big bang theory, right? Okay. Everything happens with the global flood. That's how everything ex- explained it. Right. Um, a global flood doctrine uh, flood geology is young earth creationism big bang theory and if you like torpedo that then everything else falls down like all their explanations of why there's you know because because the, the, in their thinking there's no there's no physical death in the world before adam okay. right mm-hmm. so they so all of this this geology layers of of fossils and various records of things that are dying and dead and animal, you know, disasters and stuff. They have to put that after Adam because of their theology. And that's what the flood does. It gives them the explanation to say, no, no, all this stuff wasn't before Adam at all because there was no death before Adam. And so the flood becomes their, the, the answer for their biological view of the curse. A lot of parents don't understand that this all hangs together in young earth creationism. So if, if you can torpedo that doctrine of the global flood doctrine, um, and that's what I was writing at, writing about, then the entire paradigm of young earth creationism goes like in the wastebasket. It's over. It's over. Well, no, no, no wait, wait a minute, Tim, because I want to under, people to understand what I'm saying. Are you saying that the Bible does not teach a flood that covered the whole planet? Right. So, so what we discovered as we studied that issue and looked at other arguments and you know there's this has been a long debate even before preterism um global flood local flood debates in the scientific fields you know particularly through the the 20th century Um, and there's a lot of different very variations on the idea but what we showed is that the flood of noah begins not in genesis chapter 6 which everybody starts off with it actually begins in Genesis 5 because the whole flood story is inserted into the genealogy of Seth, beginning in Genesis chapter 5, running all the way through Genesis chapter 9. Mm-hmm. So if you start and understand that this 
is dealing with the, the line of Seth. This is a covenant line, you know, okay. like, like, like Israel. When we're talking about the Great Tribulation, we're not talking about all human beings. We're talking about a context, a right. covenant context with Israel. Well, if you see that Genesis 5 sets the context for the whole flood story, then obviously that's talking about a particular place dealing with a covenant people, the line of Seth, that get wiped out in a covenant judgment, um, you know, God wiping them out. So, so that that covenant issue is, you know, ignored by very, very many people um, when they come to the text because they just they just jump right in the middle of the story and never ask, you know, what's the wider context of the story in Genesis chapter five? Mm -hmm. And um, what are the issues of the line of Seth? Why is that important being the line of Abraham later uh, and Moses later? And then, of course, all the way through to Messiah right. with the coming of Jesus Christ from Judah. So that's a very, very big issue. But, um, you know, young earth creationists come at it. Well, this is about a science. This is about a science explanation. Mm -hmm. You know, they just they just assume that because to them, everything that's real and true is science. You know, they have been completely sort of formed by a modern scientific mindset. So so those but, are the issues that we raise in the book. Right. But but is in this um, the view of most of us? I know that this is my view when I was growing up. This is what I was taught in the churches that I went to, that so long as Christianity has existed, Christians have always taught uh, a global flood with a young earth is is. And this is some of the stuff that you actually deal with in the book. Could you uh, speak on that just for a moment? It's very complicated. And the history is really drawn out because you have a variety of things going on. Um, <laughs> At some at some levels, the idea of a literal reading of Genesis one through three is is relatively new. It's new since the Reformation because Luther said, you know, we disagree with the fathers about Genesis creation. We take it at literal days, vero de dies is the Latin term, true days, as opposed to the church fathers. So so the the, the interpretation um, has a history, and people did not take Genesis one literally. In fact. Augustine viewed Genesis 1 as prophetic yes. of all covenant history. Well, that's, that's kind of where we are with covenant creation. It's, it's right. related to the story of redemption, not science. Right? So, so you have that. But at the same time, they never really had this idea of like long ages. So for, for like Augustine's view or, or the other early fathers, they really kind of viewed things, you know, the material universe, how, whatever, however you understand that or think of that, was relatively young, and then we're coming up on the sixth day, the six thousand years, yes. which is leading up to the the consummation, right? And that that actually gets picked up in dispensationalism too. But the, the church fathers had that idea that 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 history unfolds in these six thousand of years, and now we're just like right on the cusp of, you know, the the return of Christ. The judgment day, the you know the entire remaking of the physical universe. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, there really isn't a really simple question because there's such a variety of different ideas, different eras. You know, the, the Reformation was throwing out a lot of like um, allegorical interpretations uh, because things had gone to an excess, uh, mm -hmm. extreme of of just bizarre like um, discussions about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin right it's scholastic right. Um, uh things so so the reformation reacted against that and they and they kind of went to a very literal approach and by the way they also had the idea that there's certain parts of the bible we need to throw out too i mean luther believed that james isn't scripture right, right. it's a straw epistle so so this is in the bigger context of a fight between roman catholic ideas and protestant ideas that's going on in the bigger picture. And uh, it gets really complicated and drawn out. And of course, um, we're all products of our historical context. So, you know, it's it's a fascinating study um, and it's a very involved thing, but um, it's interesting. But there's not really a simple question to that. Um, right. You know, the 19th century and then 20th century gets a little bit more easy to understand and we we deal with that with a chapter chapter six of right. beyond creation science that i refer people to Amen. now uh we have a brother here uh his name is tyrone 
And I believe Tyrone is also a preterist. Uh, and uh, I believe that he also believes in covenant creation. And he says, and I just quote, Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 is the eschatology of the Bible. The eschatology taught by the prophets, Jesus, and the apostles finds its foundation in Genesis. The reason even among full prayer is that there are so many questions about the correct biblical interpretation of the end time events like the millennium reign is because we have failed to understand that the foundation starts in Genesis. Would you um, comment something on that? Uh, and I, I'm sure that he's, you are in great agreement, but I would like to hear your comment on this, uh, Brother Tim. I, I don't think I can improve that. <laughs> yeah. That, that's very good. I, and, I, and I agree. And I agree I, with that. I think I could add a couple things of, of like examples of this. Okay. Uh, because there are movements within preterism like Israel only ideas, or there are also ideas of universal salvation uh, ideas within preterism. And if you think about it, um, I think I would apply this to what he's referring to because both of those views start with a material creation okay. as the starting point for their eschatology. For a universalist, obviously, the idea that Adam is the, the beginning of all the human race and Jesus' salvation saves Adam and all of his people, there is your universalism. Not hard to understand. Right. Um, so so that's, that's involved in present, but it's an assumption of that this is talking about the physical material creation that leads you to those conclusions. You know, covenant creation goes a completely different way and it just, just overturns that entire paradigm. Mm -hmm. So Israel only people, they would say, well, it's talking about a local creation with just Adam, which is just Israel. There's nobody else involved. Right. Cause right. they assume about material creation. Mm -hmm. And if you start with Adam as the only person and it's Israel, then all you have is saved is Israel. Right, right. So the right. material creation is leading to Israel only ideas, which covenant creation denies. Right. Because when you talk about the covenant creation, it's not just Adam that's in the story, right? Adam is given a purpose to take care of and shepherd the animals around him mm -hmm. into the knowledge of God. He's God's priest. Adam is God's first priest. He's supposed to represent God to everyone else. Right. Now we're talking about a different understanding of Genesis creation that completely denies and undercuts Israel only on this side and universalism on that side, because both of those views are the same. They have right. a material creation. Mm -hmm. And covenant creation is entirely different. And uh, we see that going with, um, you know, the fulfillment of Revelation 21, 1, you have no more sea. You know, in the holy city, in the New Jerusalem, you have only people. Right. right. No more animals. They're all in the fullness of Messiah, in the fullness of the image of God, mm -hmm. reflecting God's glory, being a royal priesthood to those out in darkness and 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 offering them, you know, through the ministry, the priestly ministry, the free gift of waters of life and salvation in Jesus Christ. It's beautiful. I, I don't know how to explain this to new people other than when you see the story of scripture unfold from the story of Adam, God's son, actually, that's the way it's presented in Genesis 5 and in Matthew. Adam is God's son. He's a baby. He's in the garden. I mean, it's just like, you know, how do babies come into this world, right? You've had eight and I've had nine. Right. So we have a lot of experience about this. How do babies come in this world? Well, naked. they come in naked and unashamed. They don't care right. that they're <laughs> right, right. Oh, that's a baby. That's the story. That's where the story begins. And as you unfold the story and follow the corporate body of Adam, what you see is Adam, you know, he's growing up. And, you know, his issue in the garden is he doesn't have a wife. And if you mm -hmm. think about that in terms of the original audience of the ancient Near East, well, you, if you don't have a wife, you don't have posterity, right? You can't right. have more children. You can't have inheritance. You, you don't have significance. So, so God is God is involved in this covenant relationship with His beloved Son to bring all of these things into into have into into reality. And and yes, they screw up, they fall, and they're sent out of exile. But at the same time, in God's grace, God goes God's presence goes with them out of the garden. 
And you see the story unfold with Noah, who becomes, you know, Noah finds grace in God's eyes. He's like, you know, Noah's like the man of the ark, and he brings all the animals into the ark to save them from God's judgment. You mm -hmm. know, picturing, picturing another greater Noah to come, and who's going to save not just Israel, he's going to save the nations, right? And then you have Abraham. Abraham's got this, you know, he's got this mature faith. He's called out of the land, uh, of the land of Ur. He's he's you know from the wilderness, but then God puts him into the um, the promised land, like a new garden, the garden of God concept. And right. you know what, what, what's Abraham's problem? I mean, he has a wife, so he's growing up, he's learning maturity and and everything. But Abraham has a problem too, and it's he doesn't have a, he doesn't have an heir, right? You know, it's like it's like an older version of the problem of Adam in the garden. It's like so he, he, he now has a wife, but he doesn't have an heir. So now there's a there's a progression. Now the, to right now, the question is, is how is Abraham gonna gonna get an heir? Is he going to listen to God's voice that promised him from your loins? Mm. I will give you an heir. Or is he gonna listen to his wife, who says, "Take my servant Hagar." See, right. It's a temptation. And this temptation theme happens over and over and over and over and over again with the patriarchs. And it's like it's a, like a replay of the Adam story all over again. And even in God's grace, you know, it's it's, you know, God works through all of the the disobedience and the the the, the faithlessness of his people with even going into Israel to bring about his salvation and the inheritance of eternal life. It's just a beautiful story. And, and I don't understand really why, why people that are new to it react so strongly to it, because it's like, this is just gorgeous and understanding that all of the beautiful things that God has done with his people, beginning with Adam as a story of the covenant people of God who are given a mission, who are given a special place to, to serve as God's priest in the old covenant order. And that sets all of the pattern for the new covenant people who are God's priests and kings in the world. It's just gorgeous. And 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 if I if I just get through to you know some idea, it's just look at the beauty of the biblical narrative in these terms of redemption and salvation. And and when you do that, the whole idea of science is like. Why would we even want to make the Bible about it? Because it's so gorgeous in the idea of covenant relationship as being the center of the world, right? Because that's what that's what covenant relationship is. It is your world. <laughs> now, now, Tim, you say you don't understand why people respond to this, but I think you do. And uh, it's, a, it's a big word that starts with T, the traditions. It is tradition. It yeah. is tradition. Uh, yeah. would, would, you, would you speak about that, how that uh, interacts with the ideas that you guys are bringing forth in covenant creation and even in covenant eschatology, uh, that mountain that we all have to climb to, to get over, to begin to see on the other side. Um, whenever you bring up the issue of tradition, you're bringing up the issue of emotion um, because tradition is something that, that provides security for emotional support. You know, you, you want to be in the tradition of the church. Um, you know, Roman Catholics get this really, really big. Uh, Protestants, though they aren't Roman Catholic, they 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 revert to that kind of thinking with you know a particular church tradition. Dispensationalists do it. So um, when we use the word tradition, what we're actually bringing up is emotion, and emotion is one of those very unpredictable features of the human psyche that you know can create a block. To, to rational thought and um, create conflict. I mean, you look at conflict in this world, you look at Zionism, right? I mean, look at the emotion that's pent up in that whole thing um, out in the, in the wider world and people are dying because of it. So it's tradition. And so that, that would be kind of my analysis. I know it's different for everybody and there's not one answer, one, you know, one so solution for everybody and you know it, it's it's hard so right. Right. now there's, there's a gentleman here uh, 
a team that uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll be very happy to know that he's actually here watching with us. His name won't come up there, but I'll tell you who he is. And he says, I became familiar with covenant eschatology while I was studying, while I was studying Genesis. And this is none other than Norman uh, Voss. Yes. Uh, and actually, I was listening while I was on my trip to Florida. Uh, right. While I had a lot of time, I was listening to his teaching on the days of uh, creation. I don't know if you want to mention anything about that because i know he's also one of the people that uh i think is included in the book at least at the beginning norm voss has been a part of the beyond creation science project almost from the beginning okay and I'm, i don't even remember how we first met or talked but um he was such a father figure to me about a lot of this stuff and, and he, he has a family story that goes back multiple generations with preterism and this whole Genesis debate stuff and evolution and all that stuff. We asked Norm to write the forward of Beyond Creation Science. So, so Norm Voss is a contributor to the book. Yes. And, and it's such a small thing because behind the scenes, Norm was, was instrumental in challenging me in different ways that I kind of didn't really want to be challenged with and, and bring up ideas that I felt uncomfortable with. But... I look back on it now and it's like, you know, Norm was way ahead of us in some ways and we're just trying to catch up with Norm. Uh, so, so yeah, it's the Genesis thing. You can go that way. And, and, and actually there are people that, um, that have read our book who were just doing Genesis creation stuff and then they become preterists. Right. Right. Because the whole issue goes both ways. Right. 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 No. But I just, yeah. Appreciate Norm so much uh, for the work that he's put into this, and uh, awesome. it's fantastic. Awesome, awesome. So, what? Where is Covenant Creation going? What? What? Uh, what do you foresee? What is next? What are your plans? Uh, just for people who are looking out to to find out where 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 are we going with this? So, Chapter Twenty One of Beyond Creation Science is dedicated to exploring Christian worldview. Okay. And that was that was just my best attempt at, along with Jeff, and Jeff contributed some to that as well. Of what does it mean to be like living in New Jerusalem, right? Because you know traditional Christian theology has that Revelation twenty one and twenty two refers to heaven, you know streets of gold and the pearly gates, right? Right. right. As preterists, you know when you come to the fulfillment view of of the new covenant in Christ with all the glory of that being God's people chosen for us for a, for a, for a holy purpose. You know, it, it raises a lot of questions. So chapter 21 was my examination, sort of a kickoff of, of like exploring the implications for Christian worldview. And I've been working on that ever since. So um, what I'm going to do with my YouTube station is, really kind of explore that more because I think the implications for Christian worldview as far as covenant creation and covenant eschatology are far bigger than we can even like see right now. Mm -hmm. We can't conceive of it. And, and I, I would like to get out some issues and I, I plan to over the next few weeks on the YouTube channel that, that I am fairly confident that predators have never even asked that question let alone answer it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying I have all the answers. I don't. Um, I don't even have all the answers of the Genesis issue. Um, there are still questions in my mind about certain details. And that's just a motive. That's a motivating thing for me to keep studying. And, and, and a lot of other people are learning along with us. And they make suggestions that I think are just really helpful. And I, I've changed my thinking on certain details. But I think that we're getting to the point with preterism that as it grows, we need to have answers, real world answers to why this matters, right? How can this change the world? Right, right, right. But we can see it with Zion. You know, you look at 1948, we're going back to the ninth, the thought four declaration of 1917 and, and what chaos and destruction that a hundred years of that thinking has been. Mm -hmm. You know, we see it just plain as day. You know, this is bad theology that leads to war, right. destruction, uh -huh. 
the killing of thousands and thousands of people and everything else. Well, what if there's about 15 other different issues out there that are directly related to fulfillment right? and human culture and ways of thinking, paradigms of thought that we haven't even seen yet right. as fetters? It's, it's astonishing, you know, the potential for the predator worldview to sort of um, shake things up and provide some solutions to problems that, that appear on the surface right now as unsolvable because of the way we think in terms of, you know, futurist Christian theology. Right. It's mind boggling in my thinking. And I just want to, I just want to put things on the tables for other people to look at. I don't want to answer the questions. I want to just ask the questions because by asking the questions, that's the first step to making progress. We understand that in life in general, as we mature uh, as individuals, you know, you ask a whole bunch of different questions at 49, you know, both of us are same age. You're right. right, right. Coming up on the big five. Oh man. Yeah. What yeah. do we ask about life? Are those the same questions that you were asking at 23 years old? <laughs> so I think the whole... And by the way, as you talk about walking down, uh, down memory lane, uh, Norm, Norm Voss says, this is where he found you. He says, I found him right. on planet. Does that even exist anymore? Planet Preterist with this first no. edition. I don't, I don't think Planet no. Preterist exists. <laughs> and also this, this must have been back in. Uh -huh. In 2004, anyway, 2002 to 2006, Planet Preterist was the hot rod of preterism. Right. I mean, it was right. woo, just an information overload, like right. continuous new articles, discussion forums, and man, it was so much fun. It was just like, it was the place to be. And the technology has moved on from now. YouTube's the place to be, or you know, Facebook's the place to be now. It's like it, it just gradually moved on. Right, right. So now, I, and I know we are coming here to kind of a close, and uh, and I'm sure that everybody will love for us to come back another. I want you to come back another time, and the next time it will be more of a focus. Let's do some uh, parts of uh, beyond creation science. Let's ask specific questions on certain chapters. Let's exige it uh, that. But uh, could you give us um, just your kind of historical overview of preterism and Covenant creation, because I think they are both, to me, they are just so connected. Uh, how you have seen things developing and where things are going. Do you have a positive outlook on where things are going with preterism and, and covenant creation? Or are you like, oh my goodness, I don't know where this is going? It, it's one of those things where you're almost a victim of your own success, right? Mm -hmm. uh, back in the 1990s, there were very defined lines about where preterism was theologically. And it had to do with the reformed group that were like partial preterists, like David Chilton, Jim Jordan, Gary DeMar. I mean, Gary North actually wrote on some of this partial preterist stuff too. And, and they were kind of a very, very defined group. And then there was the Max King side, which is a church of Christ restorationist movement, independent churches, uh, ch Christian churches that had a different defined group. And Don Preston and William Bell, um, let's see, there was uh, there was uh, Kurt Simmons was from that background as well. And it was very, very either or. That was that that was full preterism. I mean, really in a nutshell, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reformed guys weren't full preterists, but there were guys that were going full preterists, like Walt Hibbard. He was the president of Great Christian Books, a huge Christian book distributorship, was full preterist. You know, and he's, he loved our book. We've got him on the back cover uh, before he passed away. And he was such a big fan of our work. But um, now I, there is no like source for these new preterists, right? It's new, new full preterists are coming in from all different denominations, all different church perspectives, different levels of culture. You know, there's like the, the regular blue collar guys who work hard for a living like me, they're our preterists full preterists. And then there's like scholars that are getting to be full preterists. And, and, you know, the people in church leadership and pastors, pastors are like becoming full preterists and the whole congregation's going with them. Right. right. It's, it's huge compared to where 
we were in the 1990s. And I'm not saying it's it's a majority or anything, or, or even uh, it's still a small, small, small sliver of the American church scene, but it's growing exponentially. And boy, when that gets to a certain level, um, there's going to be some pretty, I, I believe there's going to be some pretty obvious things, um, shakeups and earthquakes within evangelical, you know, even maybe Pentecostal circles, um, reform circles. That's already going on now with the Gary DeMar controversy. It's like, what do you do with Gary DeMar um, from a credo perspective? Right. So that's that's what's going on. It's a we're kind of a victim of our own success because all these people are coming in to full preterism, and they all come from a particular theological tradition. So they have certain ideas in their their mind of you know past beliefs mm-hmm. and certain cultural expectations. And so so there's there's a lot of chaos, you know, for new preterists like well, what about the millennium and you know what is this and what's the two witnesses of Revelation or whatever. Right. That, that's all fine. I mean, everybody's got to go through those questions, and I think they'll be resolved. We'll mature through all this, and actually, it's good because then we have to keep learning, right? We have to keep absolutely keeping re-examining certain old answers that you know may need to be tweaked a little bit on things. So it's really healthy. Uh, the new blood is is certainly healthy, but it brings in a lot of um, variety of ideas that you know you almost have to go through a winnowing process to sort. Of Right. You don't need the baggage. <laughs> you can leave that one with your old church because, you know, it's obsolete now as a preterist. And that's kind of where I want to work with the covenant creation stuff is sort of break people out of out of their narrow denominational settings and 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 histories and traditions and and show that, you know, preterism is it's a big thing in the wider history of Christian theology and the church scene. And, uh, you know, we, we are going to see, I'm absolutely convinced that you and I are going to see some, some unbelievable things in the coming decades. You know, if God gives us the, the life to see that and uh, continues to pour out, you know, I mean, the internet, it's like the gatekeepers at churches can't keep people away from it. Right. Right. You can, I can go watch Steve Magua in the week. Well, right. I go to the Futurist Church, and man, I'm learning so much from this Steve Magua guy because I'm online, right? I mean, it's like the gatekeepers are losing control, man. The old, yeah. the old institutions. Yeah. Right. You know, you mentioned uh, you mentioned the American Church and what is happening with uh, you know the growth because preterism really was, I guess, in the '90s and the in the 2000s was really really more of an American thing. But I don't know if you know this. I, I don't think I've ever told you. How I came to find out about you was from a South African pastor that I know. So this guy, uh, he, he came to my to my ministry, and we were discussing full preterism and you know the questions about the second coming of Jesus and all that. And then he asked me, "Brother, do you believe in covenant creation?" And I said, "I said, what is that?" He said, "Oh, you need to check it out." Uh, and he said, "Well, he kind of just explained." I said. And the moment he said, I said, well, I do believe in something like that, but I'll have to check it out to answer you directly. So that's how I came. So I went to the YouTube and I began to search for Covenant Creation. I came across the 2010 conference and I watched all those, yeah, all those videos and I started following and I said, this is what I believe. This is what I've been thinking Genesis is. So that, so it's not just American, it's, it's all over the place. And there's a lot of people outside of America because of the internet that are also plugging into to all these things that have to do with covenant eschatology and covenant creation. That's a great story. I did not know that. But I was going to ask you one more thing since since we had this conversation at the at the right. conference in August. You said you said it was just an awkward idea to sort of take physical universe ideas and assumptions out of Genesis chapter 1. So let me ask you we're we're 5 months or so down the road. Do you feel more comfortable with seeing the scriptural narrative in terms of a covenant context, even with Genesis chapter one now than oh, even five months ago? Without without question, without question. Uh, and, I, and I'll be the first one to admit, and, and I, I know that especially you guys, uh, you and, and Jeff were watching me as I was coming up and trying to explain it. Like, no, 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 uh, no. That's not it. Uh, and, uh, but 
Now I feel more confident, not only because I've studied uh, uh, beyond creation science a number of times and of course interacted with you, sat under your teaching and others, but also when I start to see people like John Walton and read their works and other people that are not even preterists, that are not even, uh, have nothing to do with preterism, that have nothing to do with covenant creation and to begin to understand how to study the scriptures from uh, an ancient Near East perspective. Yes. Let me recommend this to your audience. This is really kind of a parallel sister book to be on yes. creation science. John H. Walton, Hebrew scholar from Wheaton College. Fantastic, fantastic book. This book came out a year and a half after Beyond Creation Science. So, you know, we're not, you know, we're not associated at all. But if you read this book, you'll see, wow, that's a parallel idea and right. certainly information. So we should probably recommend that. Oh, absolutely. And, and later on, when, when, I'm, when I'm doing the editing, I will, I will try to make sure that I add the, the links yes. to not only Beyond Creation Science, but also uh, John Walton's book. That, that book truly has, has helped me to understand BCS even, even more. Uh, so I, I, am, I am definitely more confident. I am, I am definitely sure that this is uh, the direction that preterism should be, uh, should be going. I'm not, I'm not struggling with it so much as to, uh, I don't know if it is. Uh, I still don't have a well, I think all the issues, but I, I definitely, I'm in a more comfortable place. St. Louis, in St. Louis, if you remember when you were talking to me, had that, we had that conversation. I said, give it time and just right. keep studying. And I, I said, it would come to you. It becomes natural with time. And okay. you start seeing the pair. You see stuff about Genesis 1 in the Bible all over the place. And, and that, for new people, that's very strange because we think Genesis 1 is just about Genesis 1. But right. when you start reading the Bible and the prophets and the law and the New Testament, it's like, wow. It's just, it's the eschatology of everything in Bible eschatology. Right. Uh, it's Genesis of Bible eschatology, as as the, you you pointed out earlier from 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 a viewer who put that quotation up. So, um, but thank you, Steve, for for your time and effort. And I I gotta say to everybody here, I'm gonna say it now. I've been to preterist conferences for going on 20 years now, maybe even a little bit more. And that that conference in St. Louis with Steve Magua and the Church at the Well asked the pastor conference back in August was one of the sweetest fellowship times I have ever seen. It was unbelievable. So, you know, it, I'm going to put the word out there, Steve. If you do that again, I think there is a plan. Oh, for next we year. are definitely doing it again uh, okay. next year, same time in August. So we are going to have uh, another everybody know. You are coming, whether you like it or not, brother. If yeah. God keeps you till then. <laughs> I look forward to it, Steve, but I, I'm just telling the audience here. I mean, the Kenyans, you know, singing Swahili at the <laughs> conference. Right. Praising God in Swahili. I'm telling you, it's like nothing I've ever experienced before in my life. And you don't want to miss out when Steve puts on another conference because I'm sure you're only going to get better from your experience. And uh, Amen. Amen. boy, that was, that was, a, I'll never forget that conference and the fellowship that we had with, with all you guys and your people. You know, your friends who, you know, from Africa, it's like, right. I was standing there just saying, how, how does this happen in God's providence? I mean, this is just amazing. So it's just fantastic, Steve. And I thank you for that because I know it took a lot of work and uh, I do hope you carry on with it, brother. Oh, absolutely. We will. Uh, and of course, uh, let's, let's also do a mention there, brother Michael Miano from Blue Point Bible Church, where you had the next conference also was with us and uh, quite a, a good number of people. So we are right. definitely planning to have another conference. Now, Tim, if you can inform our viewers, uh, I, and I know we already talked about it uh, earlier on, and I'm going to put it up here in a second again, uh, concerning where can they find you? Where where can they view uh, the material that, that you have? And right. where can they get the book if they want uh, a, a hard copy book of the Beyond right. Creation? Uh, science. So the center of everything right now is the beyondcreationscience.com website. And on the front page there, you can download the entire book for free if you want, you know, if you just want access to the book. There's also a link there to Don Preston, who also carries the last remaining physical copies. 
I don't even know how many copies he has left, but um, it's mm -hmm. very, very limited supply. And those were donated to Don. And any any money that goes to those books is 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 going to support Don okay. and uh, his work there at Preterist Research Institute. So if you want a physical copy, get one soon because we are, you know, I have no inventory other than just a basic, you know, personal reserves, a few left for myself and my my kids and kids' kids kind of thing. And <laughs> I don't want to give those away. Um, there is a there is talk that someday we'd reprint the book. Um, and that is a real possibility, but it's not going to be anytime soon. We've got other issues. So that's the first thing, beyondcreationscience.com. I just started the YouTube channel, which you can also access through the beyondcreationscience.com website on the front. And I'm putting up a lot of old material, old covenant creation conference material, and I'm generating new content based on the work that we did, you know, at your conference and Michael Miano's conference that I'm going to, I'm going to reorient that material for YouTube platform and in smaller pieces and uh, make it a series. And I'm actually calling that a curriculum series because that's the most up-to-date uh, detailed work on covenant creation that I'm aware of. It's my work that I've been doing since 2010. Uh, so it's many, many years of research and, and just sort of note taking and thinking about the issues that's coming over the next few weeks. Cause I go back to work in springtime, but I have the whole winter to okay. sort of put that curriculum out. Uh, then I'll go back to work on the farm and I'm going to talk a little bit about the farm in that, in that presentation, some details, but um, the YouTube channel is going to be, I think a really big asset. I was dragging my feet to start that because I have so many different things that require my attention and children priority and family and, you know, businesses that I run, but, you know, now getting into it and getting past the initial learning curve, I'm really excited about the YouTube channel because it's just, right. it's taken off. Just, you can oh, see that um, it's getting, it's getting good interest. And that, that just encourages me to keep on putting up good content because that's really what rules uh, YouTube. It's good content. Awesome. awesome, and I can tell you, uh, brother, you are, you have done your homework. The 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 cabin behind you is beautiful. The presentations have been awesome. So um, again, on the screen, beyondcreationscience.com, you there, there are links there, not only to the free PDF copy of the book, uh, and other many many other links, and also uh, a link to the YouTube channel right there. Now, if somebody wanted just to go on YouTube directly so that they can find you. What name do you run under on the so YouTube channel? YouTube channel's name is Covenant Creation. Very simple. And okay. it will come up on a search because you know we've, we've been working now for, for a few weeks. So it's in that algorithm of, of the search function on YouTube. So if you just type in Covenant Creation, it'll pull up the Covenant Creation on YouTube channel. Very simple. Very good. So I want to recommend uh, for those who are watching us, uh, even if you're on Facebook or wherever you're watching us from, go to YouTube, look for Covenant Creation. Uh, you'll find uh, Tim's channel. You'll see his handsome face up there. Uh, this is how you look like when you are 49 going on 50. You know, that, that's just me and him right now. So yeah, anyway, right. Uh, please yeah. subscribe, subscribe to his channel. Uh, hit that notification bell and Yes, sir. Right now, you're doing at least a video a week, right? At least, sometimes more. I'm putting up videos as fast as I can, man. As fast as <laughs> <laughs> Very well. So, uh, Tim, I want to thank you so much uh, for availing yourself today. I know this was uh, just uh, very quick. I called you this morning, and I yes. said, "Can we? Can we meet here?" And I know for those who are viewing us, we didn't answer every question and every objection. Uh, but what I would like to recommend is before you claim that you can poke holes in what uh, Tim and Jeff have written, at least read the book. Be a good Berean. It is a very Bible-based book. It is not about uh, science per se. It is actually an approach of going beyond the creation science that has become the standard and actually looking at the biblical text and connecting covenant eschatology with uh, covenant uh, creation. Now, brother Tim, I'm going to give you the last word. Uh, whatever it is that comes to your mind, whatever the Lord puts on your heart, um, just go ahead and then after that we will close. 
I would just say to the audience, you know, we're, we're open for reproof and correction and, you know, we don't have all the answers and we may be wrong about things. Um, I just want to say, you know, if you want to communicate um, problems that you have and stuff, I, I just want to be real clear that I'm open to, to criticism and evaluation. Uh, I think it needs to be a fair evaluation um, and it needs to be thought out, but um we, we don't claim that we have all the solutions to this and we're all the, you know, the end all to this. There's a lot of other people studying along with us too. And um, they should be listened as well, listened to as well. But I'm open um, to going different directions if the scriptures don't teach that. And, you know, send your, send your objections and, and explain why. That's all I ask, you know, from, from my perspective. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Brother Tim. This has been awesome. Uh, I've actually been uh, yearning just to hang out with you and fellowship with you and just <laughs> listen to you. And uh, uh, I, I, I've truly enjoyed this. And I hope that our viewers also have not only enjoyed, but especially they have gained something of an idea of what uh, covenant creation has to do with. And they are now motivated to go to Beyond Creation Science or to the uh, Covenant Creation uh, YouTube uh, channel. We wish you... Uh, a very good rest of your year, uh, Brother Tim, and a very great success with the, with the new YouTube channel. And uh, we look forward to seeing you definitely in August as you come to teach at our St. Louis uh, Eschatology Conference. I wouldn't miss that one, man. After after last year, whew, we got <laughs> to make that the highlight of the year now. It's awesome. like so wonderful. Thank you very much. And, and and your wife as well for all the all the effort that you guys put into that. So awesome. We're, we're thinking definitely that direction. <laughs> very well. Well, thank you, thank you, brother Tim. Have a very good evening, and please hi, say hi to your family. Uh, well, and we love you, man. Love you too, Steve. We'll see you soon. All right, awesome. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, good friends and family. Uh, I hope that uh, you are able to gain something uh, from that interview. This was simply an interview. Today was not a teaching session. I know generally in this ministry, you come here for teaching where we go verse by verse. And I hope that I made it very clear from the beginning when we, we announced that this was just simply an interview with the author of Beyond Creation Science, uh, Tim Martin. And uh, he has definitely uh, spoken widely about many different issues. Again, I want to recommend, please go on ahead and uh, go to beyondcreationscience.com. You can get yourself a free copy of the book in PDF form. Uh, you can also go to Don Preston's um, website to get uh, the remaining copies if you if you if you like a hard copy. Uh, I I can tell you, I can assure you, it will abundantly and immensely bless you. You may not end up agreeing with Tim and Jeff. You may not end up agreeing with what I understand about uh, creation, uh, covenant creation. But at the very least, uh, you know, be a good Berean. Study it. Uh, and uh, whether you come to believe what they are saying there or not, at least let it be on a foundation of I actually studied it for myself. I compared it with the scriptures and so on and so forth. So, uh, from our studio tonight uh, here at Ask the Pastor Bible Study Live. That will be all uh, for us and from us. Now, if you want to uh, communicate with us or even, uh, you know, forward questions to Brother Tim, if you cannot find him online somehow, which I doubt, scrolling at the very bottom is uh, the contact information for this ministry. There's my phone number. There's an email there. There's even ways to contribute to this ministry if the Lord should put that on your heart. We will appreciate uh, any anything that uh, that you would like uh, to associate with us, so long as it's godly and so long as it's a blessing uh, even to yourself. So until the next time, God bless you abundantly. abundantly. May you have a very, very happy new year and see you the next time that we have a teaching session here at Ask the Pastor Bible Study Live. This is your host, Steve Magua, and our guest tonight was Tim P. Martin from Montana, the author of Beyond Creation Science. God bless you. Until the next time.